Welcome to the Audio Master Show. Thank you for joining in tonight. We got a lot of great things going on, and one is a Sure SM7B microphone giveaway. Yes, man. All you have to do is hit that subscribe button right down there. Hit it like a snare. Slam that bell. And type down there as to why you like a sure microphone. And that will get you in. Oh, man. I'm pumped up tonight, man. I actually, uh, we're making up the Audio Master t-shirts. And I went down there to the t-shirt shop today, man. And they're going to be able to make some really cool shirts for me. To give out to you guys, and uh, we're going to have some lucky winners, too, for some. So, I'm excited and stoked, but tonight we're going to be talking about um, how do you like to start your mix. And once you get a good balance on the mix, are you content with that? Mm, man, I had somebody write in the other day, and they were... Because I had mentioned before uh, about, you know, getting a good mix and creating a good balance and then tearing it apart. And this guy, uh, the White Knight, writes in and says, oh, man, you know, uh, why do I want to tear my mix apart after I've already got a good balance? So tonight I want to share with you guys some great information that's going to help you out in making your mixes sound more interesting and don't we all want our mixes to sound more interesting, not static and very boring? Even if it's not the best song in the world, wouldn't it be kind of neat to create some really cool mixes? Yeah, I know, man. So I'm going to give you some pointers tonight, man. So if you want to get your little notepad out or get your iPhone out and hit your notes, start typing in some cool notes, man, it's going to help you out. <sighs> Man, you know what? I'm going to do something here. Hang on one second, guys. Um, okay, yeah, we'll just wait on that. But I want to tell you how... Um, so how do you like to start your mix out? What do you typically do when you start your mix out? Is there certain instruments that you like to um, start to work on first? Is that something you typically like to do? Work on a specific instrument first? Maybe it's your voice. Maybe it's the guitar that you start EQing right away. You know, everybody wants to start hitting that EQ right away. Everybody wants to start hitting those compressors and all those kind of cool little tools right away. Man, hold off on all that stuff. Hold off on all that good stuff. Those are little toys that we're going to get to play with later on in the mix. We're going to get to enjoy them all, and we're going to get to learn about all those little cool little toys compressors and eqs and side chaining and all those interesting things man wow i get stoked when i start talking about building a mix because it is a beautiful thing and it's like artwork to me man it's like it truly is an art and learning how to mix good is an art after a while you kind of know the colors that you want to paint with and you can kind of fly through things a lot faster once everything's cleaned up that's why all these major league, major league uh, recording engineer guys have an assistant engineer, or maybe two or three, because they want them to do all the little legwork first, man. Clean up those tracks, start DBing those S's down, you know, if they're further along as to knowing how to mix. But cleaning up things and then saying, okay, here, I'm going to hand the ball off to you. And you make the touchdown. And that's how it rolls, man. But, so, you know, for me, it really doesn't matter uh, a lot of times. A lot of times I like to, depending on what instruments are on the, on the tracks, typically like to start with the kick drum and the snare, the drums, and then the bass guitar. So that's typically my foundation, and a lot of other engineers, that's how they like to work. They'll put the drums first, then the bass guitar, and they'll work on those because that is the cement to your foundation of a mix. Yeah, that's the cement of your foundation. If your foundation is weak, then your structure falls so your foundation has to be locked in. Everything has to be lined up. You know, you got to line all that stuff up, man, to where they're hitting at the same time. 
once things are lined up, you'll notice right away how much stronger and more powerful and punchier the mix becomes. Wow. Yeah, man. Start out with your drums and your bass guitar, man. Just go ahead and start out with that. But uh, as far as what's in order on the tracks, that's that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about EQing first. I'm not talking about compressors first. I'm not talking about anything. I'm just talking about how my layout is on my um, on my track sheet. It's usually typically drums, bass, guitar. Then I'll either have um, guitar or keyboards, or if it's piano, piano, and then guitars. And then as we keep on going, all that ear candy stuff kind of falls in a little later on, like hand claps, things like that. Uh, things that's going to be coming in and out of the mix. Save all that stuff for the later on tracks, man. I hope you guys are taking, that, taking notes because we're really starting to get down to some really cool stuff for you guys, man. So anyway, what I typically like to do, we're going to run through this kind of fast. Okay, so let's just say I have 10 tracks, okay? I got 10 tracks, or let's just say a little more because I've got drums. I like to always get a great balance with no EQ, or at least try, just try to get a good balance with no EQ and no compressors or none of that, any, any of that other stuff that we can add to the inserts or the buses, so what we're going to do right now is we're just going to concentrate on getting a good balance using what? What do we use whenever we try to get a good balance? Do we use the VU meters? I guess we could if we're deaf or, or at least we're getting old like a lot of us. But here's the thing, man. You know what we have to work with other than VU meters? I'll let you take a guess as to what we have to work with other than VU meters. We have pink noise. We have pink noise to work with. But what we want to do is we want to use our ears first and we want to bring start bringing things up. Start bringing, pulling those faders up on all the instruments and create a good mix, a good balance. That might that might um, be actually painting some things far right and far left, but get a good balance first, okay? Because we're going to come back at it again. So once we start adding all those effects and all those delays and reverbs and all those compressors and EQs on everything, we're going to do it again. And we're going to see how good our ears are. And we're going to be testing our ears along this, along this journey is what we're doing. This is a journey from start to finish. So, I say to you, use that pink noise, man. Use your ears first. Then strap the pink noise on the master track. Okay? Once you think you've got a good mix as to where everything's at, you might want to take a picture. You might want to see, you know, actually where you're at on the, uh, on the faders. Take a picture of everything. That way you know exactly where everything is set. And then bring those faders back down. Once you think you've got a good mix, bring those faders all the way back down. Strap on pink noise and do one track at a time. You're hearing that pink noise. That's what it kind of sounds like. What you want to start doing is bringing up fader number one. That may be your kick drum. Start bringing up that kick drum to where you barely start to hear it. And then back it off a smidget. And then look at your picture that you took on the phone and see if you're anywhere close. Well, what you want to do is you want to do all your tracks like this. So it's bringing up one till you start to hear it. Then once you start to hear the kick, back it off a smidget. Go through all your tracks like this individually. And then look at your camera and see, are you close? Are you, are you close? Are your ears telling you what you thought was a good balance? Is it close to pink noise? If it is, good. It can be a little off here and there. And it probably is going to be a little off here and there. But here's the thing. Go ahead and use the reference of the pink noise first. Okay? That's a general good start, man. Now you know you're in the ballpark of having a good balance of all your mix 
before you even start adding EQs and all this other good stuff that you're going <clears> to <throat> put on a, put on everything. Then after you do that, you know you're in the ballpark. Then start actually um, using some of your tools that you have to work with. Perhaps what I like to do is I like to bus my drums to another track with three compressors on there. Okay? Three separate compressors. What this does for me, it doesn't make one compressor have to work so hard. What you want to do is have some gain staging in there where you're hitting the first compressor just a little bit, tickling the meters, hitting the second compressor, and start gain staging it to where you can kind of use your ears. Continue to use your ears. And if it sounds starting to sound pretty good, if it's starting to sound pretty good, then just ease on back. Don't touch anything. Move on. Move on to the next track. Continue on like this. By using three different compressors, especially on your drums, you're hitting those transients, and then you're also adding some ice cream in, uh, to the mix as well. So it's going to start gluing things together. It's going to glue those drums together and make your song start to sound as one and not separate. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to glue everything together in a cohesive way and not overwork one one compressor or whatever and so this is a good thing so you can do it you can add these compressors in and what it's going to do like i say uh it's not going to work one compressor so hard because there's you're going to actually get some different uh tonalities out of these different compressors as well so use that to your advantage move on down move on down move on down until you actually get all your tracks to where you have a good blend and it sounds like it's gelling together, man. And it's not going to take long because what's happening here is you're starting to glue those tracks together by those compressors. Now, you might find that you have some masking going on. You might be saying, what the heck is masking, man? Dude, what are we talking about masking? Masking is where instruments that take up a certain frequency or create or in that certain frequency range, start masking with other instruments that are fighting for the same space. It happens all the time. It really happens with uh, drums or the kick drum, your toms with the bass guitar. They share these same frequencies and they're going to be trying to punch each other out, trying to say, look, man, I want to be heard. So when this happens, it cancels things out masking and so you find yourself pushing up those faders and pushing up those faders till finally everything's freaking out of whack and you don't understand why you can't hear the bass guitar anymore you don't understand why you can't hear the kick drum anymore wow and it happens to all of us though y'all so if this is happening to you don't feel like you know you're the lone ranger man this is just part of the part of the deal and look at this as part of the ride, and you're going to accomplish this, and you're going to knock this thing out, and you're going to give every instrument their own space to live in, whether it's panning hard right and left, whether it's pulling things back and delay, whether it's, you know, having a delay on the guitar over here and just shooting it to the other side of the stereo field, and then vice versa to heat that space. This is what you want to do. This is what you really want to concentrate on as to knowing what instrument takes up what space in the frequency range. Okay. And there are other videos out there that you can check on that, man. Just find out. Um, they pretty much show you, like I know, acoustic guitar, you know, all the energies around four or 500 hertz. And so let's just say you have two guitars playing and you want to hear both of them. You might want to pull the guitar pan to the right around the 400 or 500 hertz down with a little bell-shaped EQ. You want to create those bells in there, pull him down at that 4 or 500 hertz, and the other guitar, push him up, say a dB, around that 400 or 500 hertz. And what that's going to do is create this space like this. Okay? This guitar is up here. This guitar is... Um, negative EQing down here and it's going to create that space now you're going to hear both the guitar guitars without having to push the faders up okay 
some little pointers here, man, it's going to help you out. Once you start to hear everything clearly and punchy, you know you're getting in the ballpark. You know, that mix is starting to sound good now, man, because things aren't masking and you're creating space for each instrument to live in. Now we're making some progress in our mix, man. Now we have a great balance. Now we have great space. We have panning hard left and right. So we're, our stereo field just isn't right here. It's nice and spread out. I want to create a nice wide stereo field. Not too wide, but wide enough. There are tools that we can use to actually widen that stereo field if we want to. But just keep it somewhere, you know, at a nice, at a nice field somewhere in here. A nice left and right. Now what we also want to do is we're moving along. We want to keep checking in mono. There's typically a little mono switch right over there on your master. And everywhere else where you can check your mix in mono. And that way, if you know you get a good mix in mono, you know whenever you shoot it back to stereo, it's going to sound awesome. You're going to be just drooling, man. So always create a good mix in mono first before you try to send everything hard left and right stereo. And by doing this, you know you're always going to be in, in the ballpark. Because it seems like nowadays everybody's listening to things in mono anyway. You know, I'm sorry, but everybody is listening to their iTunes on this right here. Everybody's listening to their iTunes on an I, iPhone. And it's a little video speaker in mono. <laughs> We're not listening to those beautiful, gorgeous monitor speakers in our studio anymore, man. We're listening to everything on our phone. Yeah, man. So I'm just, I want to help you guys out to create a good mix in mono. And then, you know, you're probably going to be, you're going to have a great mix in stereo. So I wanted to share that with you guys because a lot of people don't know. They'll mix in stereo and then they'll start listening back to things in mono. And it's like, oh man, or on their phone or in the car or or in different places, and find out, oh man, golly, where did I go wrong? It didn't sound like this in my in my recording studio. So having other reference monitors to listen to in the car, in the truck, in your brother's car, uh, on your sister's, um, on your sister's little jam box, all these different um, places to listen to is a great a great way that we can get close to our mix. Most importantly, you know, I almost left this out, man. I almost left this out. Having a reference mix. Having a reference mix to actually go back and forth. A song that's pretty much close to the genre that you're actually uh, tracking in is essential and imperative to have to A-B back and forth as you're mixing and you're going along through your workflow. You know you're not going to be perfect. It's not going to sound like the song that you're actually listening to uh, as a reference because it's been mastered already and before it even hit the radio. So there is, it may sound louder. It may sound bigger. It may even have a little color and a little sheen on it that yours don't, but that's okay. Don't stop and don't get discouraged. You're almost there, man. You're making your way. You've already balanced everything. You've already gave all the instruments a space to live in with no masking, okay? And you're already starting to get a nice hit and thump with things by creating space for all the instruments to where there isn't any phase cancellation going on. I'm trying to make this, I'm trying to explain this as best I can for you guys. It really is such a fun art, man. I feel like I'm getting all my paint and palettes out, man, and, and sharing some really cool things with you guys. So the White Knight writes in and he says, well, what do you mean, man? I already got a balance. Why in the heck should I tear it apart? It took me forever to get this balance. I don't know if he was using white no I mean a pink noise or not, uh, to get his balance. But um it's a good thing. It's a good tool to use, especially if you if you if you really haven't uh, you don't know your monitors and uh, you really can't trust your ears <laughs> or your room that you're mixing in. So use that pink noise and um, 
why not? This is what I suggest you do. Once you get a balance and everything has its space, now we want to start creating some dimension and we want to start adding uh, some more ear candy things as the mix builds. And uh, that might be, I don't know, hand claps. That might be a tambourine. All these little things that's there. And if you took it away out of the mix completely, you would notice it gone. But not so loud to where it's actually subtracting from your key element. Maybe the vocals. You know, the vocals it needs to really shine. It needs that front center stage with the spotlight on it all the time. We want the spotlight on the vocals, especially the main vocal. Harmonies are different. But the main vocal, we always want the spotlight on him. Just look at this. He's on, just look at the vocals as uh, the guy in the center of the stage who has the shot, who has the light shining on him all the time. So we're going to give him that spot. Now we might push him back. We might run a bus to where we have him. We have two tracks we can use the fader on. We have him. Uh, maybe dry on a fader and then we can bust him to another track going through some compressors three compressors okay okay a stain stage gaining on him okay and then we're also we might add some delays or let's just say we might have a fast slap back delay on this track with the vocals and then a little longer delay a little add a little more maybe 47 or 58 milliseconds somewhere in there i think that was uh what elvis presley liked a lot on his stuff but somewhere uh i want to say or paul mccartney paul mccartney i want to say he was around he loved that 78 millisecond um delay but what we want to do is create another track that we're actually using those delays and then we can use both faders as to pushing the delay in and out in real time, and we can use our automation. Ooh, now we're really smoking, man. We are using some automation. Go ahead and fire it up because it is uh, looking good now. It's starting to sound good. It's starting to sound good, man. We got some good delays going on. Okay, we got a short delay and we got a longer delay. Now we're, what we're doing is we're creating that. I'm going to try to do it like this. So we're creating that spotlight here, and then we're going back with the vocal so we're supporting that vocal and adding dimension and depth to that vocal by adding longer delays in that vocal we got to get our vocal track sounding good man because everybody truly since we gave the vocalist the center stage with the light shining on him now we need to uh he needs to uh he needs to work and he needs to shine for us because we gave him the spotlight. In other words, we gave him the stage. So we're letting him take over because he is singing. And so we got to make sure he's sounding good, man. We got to make sure he's sounding big and he's sounding good. That's my son texting in right there. I'm sorry, guys. So we do that by adding thickness, dimension, and uh, space with that vocalist now what we're doing here is once we start adding these buses or side chaining what we're doing is we're creating glue to the tracks so now we've got our drums that are side chained that are glued okay we have a dry mix fader and then we also have this fader over here that has our compressors and everything and keep in mind what's really really cool about this is is you can both use both and you can use automation for these effects to, to kick in so my vocalist let's just say i get to i get to the pre-course or the course and on one last word i want it to go hey 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 and and feather down and tail out with some nice delay on it i can do that with my automation on my effects so in real time i can actually hit when I wanted to come in, when I wanted to go on out. Now, what we're doing here is we're adding we're adding interest to the mix. Okay, already by adding automation, we're adding interest to the mix. We got things coming in and out. We got um, on our effects. 
we've not we've already created a nice stereo field so everything doesn't just sound right in the middle we've got a nice spread on everything we've got our drums in the middle maybe our kick drum now sometimes what i've uh if you listen to a lot of older mixes especially in mono that they did years ago sometimes they would uh actually pan the kick drum either a little to the right or a little to the left and then pan the, uh, the guitar a little off center as well in the opposite direction to create that space right there so there wasn't any masking in any kind of way between those two instruments. So there's a lot of things you can do with just panning uh, before you even get to your EQ, but it's good to know about both and to be able to choose from the two how you want to work it. But what we really want to do, guys, is we want to create that space and we want to give all the instruments its own space. And uh, by doing this, there's no masking. So now we got a nice punchy mix. And then we start adding our little ear candy stuff in. So we've got everything to a mix. We got everything to a balance. And by creating automation, now we're tearing it apart, man. We're just starting to give, uh, we're starting to break it down. Now, typically, a lot of times with a lot of songs, like a lot of pop songs, especially those songs in the 80s, if you listen to a lot of those songs in the 80s, I'm going to throw an artist at you, man. Maybe you like this artist. Maybe you hate this artist. But go listen to some of his songs, pop rock songs. I guess that's the category you could throw him in. Bad to the bone, Mr. Billy Idol. Any of you guys remember Billy Idol? White Wedding? Some of those tunes he did was so <laughs> rocking, right? But if you listen to those tunes, man, what is the driving force in his, other than him just, you know, killing it on the vocals, man. He was just so bad. He was the bad boy vocalist. But what is the driving force in his tunes, man? If you had to guess, what would it be? What instrument was it? Was it the guitar? If, if you guess the guitar, you know, you would think maybe, okay, guitar, because it's a pop rock song back in the 80s. Was that the driving force of the song? You might have guessed guitar. A lot of people do guess guitar. That's not it, man. The guitar is not the driving force of his tunes. Most of his tunes. Most of his tunes, the driving force of the song was the snare drum. Slam slamming that snare man that big pop with water splashing everywhere man pow it was always the snare or the kick right there driving that song and then this voice right up in front just big and i get pumped up when i start thinking about different mixes and whatever but this is what you want to do with your mix man you want to find a key element in your song Typically, it's going to be these three, unless it's just a, a metal thrashing guitar song. But it's going to be the kick drum. It's going to be, or both, the kick drum. It's going to be the snare. Okay. Uh, or it's going to be the bass guitar that drives that song. A lot of times you really hear that bass guitar just right up front. Or it may be the bass and the kick. That's the driving force. Or it may just be the snare. But find, find one of these three. You can start working with these three right off, right off the bat. And see which one you want to propel your song, to drive the song, to push it through, to give it that, uh, to give it that low end, that movement, or that snap, that hit right in your face with that snare drum. So these are just some things you guys you can start working with. I'm not talking about doubling up the tracks yet. I'm not talking about thickening up the tracks that way by, you know, taking a track and rendering it after it's already, um, let's just say your vocal track. Let's just say you already did all your pitch correction on it, cleaned it up. Everything sounds good. All your S's are DB down. Those little footballs, they're all DB down. They're not too loud. That's on the end of a line. So you've done all that kind of work. You clean things up that way. But I'm not talking about, uh, now we're going to get into this later on another video because we can go on and on. I'm just trying to help you guys get a jump start and get in there, get your mix up going. 
But uh, a lot of times what we do, or at least what I do, is after I've rendered a track, a vocal track, the lead vocal track, is I'll double that track. So I'll take that track and actually um, copy it and double it. But now I have two tracks that are perfectly the same, perfectly in unison. And man, then the sky's the limit. I can EQ different if, at that point if I want to. I can... Uh, run one through a, a fast slap back if I want to and run bust the other one. So many different things you can do with the voice is sounding thin. These are ways you can think it up. And then also with your guitars too. So the electric guitar, you can double that track. You can triple that track. Uh, I really typically don't do that with my bass guitar. However, I do like to side chain with my bass guitar at times, uh, depending on how many tracks are in the song. So these are all key elements, you guys, that are going to get you down the road a lot faster, especially whenever you use your ears on the balance with no plugins on it and use the pink noise. And then after that, uh, find the key element in the song that's going to be the driving force. Keep the vocalist in the spotlight at all the times. If he, if he, uh, <clears throat> one phrase or one word, especially if it's the starting of a new verse, you know, um, maybe uh, typically what I find a lot of times in beginners is um, when they're mixing, the second verse will come around and there'll always be either the first word or within that first sentence of the second verse that there'll be a word or two that uh, it drops out. It's like you can't hear it or it's not strong, it's not powerful. And uh, you don't want that to happen because what happens is if this guy who is the vocalist is in the spotlight and uh, all of a sudden, you know, your listener, he's listening to the lyrics and then he just drops out completely on a word or two. It's real easy to lose the interest of the listener because he's trying to hear, hear things and all of a sudden he, a word drops completely out or whatever. And just, it just uh, is so far uh, below where it needs to be as far as volume level and thickness that um you know it just separates it separates the big boys from you know the beginners and so what we want to do is make sure that everything is db right but we also want to use i love automation man i love having automation this is where this is what the big boys are doing they're using automation and they're riding those faders in real time and they may start with now that everything's balanced and we've found our key element of the song, the driving force, and it's pushing and propelling the song through, now we want to want to make sure that we're um, we take the vocals and we use automation to where we're actually just riding that gain, just a little. I'm talking a little little bitty movements with your um, automation in and out pushing and pulling little little things in and out. When the kick drum and the bass drum are hitting, giving one a little bit of space and pulling the other just a little bit back, creating this movement through all our tracks with real-time automation. And then once we get it all automated how we want, just a little bit, I'm telling you, man, just a little bitty movements. It may be where you want the snare or you want the kick drum to really sound a little, uh, and give the other ones a little space. What it's going to do is it's going to start doing this. It's going to start doing this. Now, I ain't even talking about compressors or limiters on the master track yet. That's a whole nother thing, man. And we're going to get to that. And you need that as the final glue to glue all those little bitty increments of the automation that you did on the tracks to glue it all together and just tighten it up even more. You do that by on that master track. This is something I always say for last because once I do those little small increments in automation on my vocals and perhaps maybe one or two other instruments, I don't get crazy and do it on everything, but it's usually just one or two instruments, sometimes three. Um, but after I do that, then I jet on over there and I listen back to it and I watch those little faders moving just a little bit as we're moving along the mix. Keep in mind, I'm taking my breaks after 15 minutes. I'm walking away from it. 
you typically want to get a mix up quick and do it fast because there is ear fatigue and you will lose it so fast. You'll start making some movements that are bad decisions. Once you start getting ear fatigue and uh, your ears aren't fresh to the mix. So at that point, I typically do walk away from the mix because um, you don't want to get ear fatigue and you want to come at it fresh every time. So then I'll come back. So it's important to come back to it. Now you've got a good balance with everything. You've used automation on the vocals, automation on the uh, kick drum, and uh, perhaps even automation a little bit on the snare drum. Okay, so you use three instruments that you ride that fader in real time as you write an automation. Now, once you get that going on, man, you come back to it and you listen to that and you're watching everything move here and there and you gave everything space and you gave everything dimension and you gave everything its own little spot to live in. We got one guitar over here, got another guitar over here. We got some cymbals happening, some chimes coming in up here. We got the kick drum down here in the center. We got the bass guitar pan just a smidget to the right of that kick drum. We got everything sounding good. We got uh, no masking going on because we made some EQing in, uh, in those instruments that needed some space to live in. And then we have added some delays to create depth in the mix. So we got width, depth, height, and low. We got everything going on. Man, that painting is starting to look pretty good now, man, because we're getting into that three-dimensional look. Things in the front, things in the middle, things in the back, things up. Things far left, right, and things far down. So now that one's done that, man, we're pretty we're pretty daggum happy with it. But we're lacking um we're lacking some other things. What are we lacking? What are we lacking now? We got everything sitting around six minus six dB with a little bit of flutter here and there up and down on our stereo master bus. Sometimes we're hitting a little above. Sometimes we're hitting a little low. Hmm. What's going on? Nothing. Nothing is going on that you don't want. You've got dynamics in the song. You may even have some transients still going on in the song. That's okay, man. We like that at this stage in the game, man. We like that movement, and we like that. Um, we like that thing. We like that moving in the song, and we like uh, to where everything isn't so compressed to where it just sounds like a flat line. Now, I've seen some mixes that were done after they were done, after they were mixed out, and you should look at the waveform. It's insanely sick. I want to put my finger down my throat, man, because it's like a flat line. Literally, there's no there's no movement in the waveform. There's no transients at all. It's just as flat as it can be. So we don't really want that, guys. We really don't want that. It, uh, what we want is we want um, we don't want to over compress things to where it takes all the life out of it. Now, when you're using one compressor on different things, a lot of times you can over compress it, man. It takes all the life out of it. That's why I like doing gain staging and having three compressors because if you just hit each one just a little bit it's not gonna um it's not gonna take all the life out of that track but now we're down to the master track we're listening to our 10 tracks now and everything sounded good we gave everything a place to live in we've got dimension to it right now but now what we want to do is we want to start even gluing it together more than what we have going on for ourselves. How do we do it? Well, that's the big question I want to ask you guys. Do you know? How do we do it? And this is what we typically like to do, is we want to put uh, a compressor or two on the master bus, too. We may even put a tape machine. You know, they've got these tapes that emulate tape. So we might have a tape machine. Now, these tape machines that you can actually run everything to glues the mix together too, man, big time. It starts to glue everything together. Now, I'm not going to get into the mastering part of it. 
I just uh, now, if you're mastering it yourself, that's a different story. You you may want to bring up everything or get everything going through this compressors and a limiter to where you're as close to z uh, zero dB as possible, and you know it's going to sound bigger, fatter, fuller. It's gonna uh, it's gonna be up to optimal level as what you hear on the radio at that point once you bring everything up to zero dB and you've thickened everything up and you double tracks and all this other stuff, you're going to hear it really starting to come together and sound like a polished mix at this point. But what I typically like to do is know that I got a good mix without anything, not any limiters or anything else on the master bus. And if I'm doing my own mastering, then I'll typically add all these other things in just to get an idea as to how good it sounds. And am I close to what um, my reference is as far as loudness goes? And so at that point, um, this is where a lot of times you may want to send the song off to your mastering engineer. You want to send him the tracks uh, to where, you know, you leave room around minus 6 dB. And then uh, that's plenty enough room. Some, some mastering engineers like to take in their stuff. They will accept things minus 3 dB. That gives them enough room to work with. But I like to leave at least minus 6 dB. That way, if they want to add two or three compressors, run it through their Avalon stuff, run it through their Manly stuff, run it to, uh, through whatever they need to run it through to bring it up to 0 dB, oh, man, you know it's going to shine at that point because then you can add that EQ on it, add the little smiley face on it if he needs to. And it's going to add color to your mix. It's going to give it, um, I don't know, I just like to say the milk and butter. You know, it's going to just have that sheen, that smoothness sound to it. And it's it's really going to start, it's going to translate on everything perfect at that point. Because remember, you've already listened to it through different units. You've already, you've already done the field sobriety test on it. And by the time you get it to the, the mastering engineer, all he's going to just do is make it sound better as far as adding color and uh, adding these things that really give it that um, that life force to live up to radio airplay. And so, um, you know, you can do it at yourself at the house, like I say, by using limiters and compressors and tape machines and all that other stuff on the master bus. And I've done some pretty good stuff uh, doing that myself that's sounded really good man but uh if you really want to take it to the next level uh, i suggest it, uh, go ahead and send that off to your mastering engineer take notes take notes the whole way through communicate with your mastering engineer if you can be there that's even better that we can sit in on the project and watch him work and learn a lot of things from him and ask questions if he uh if he's the type of person that doesn't mind um you know sharing information with you and whatnot but um, these are things that you want to do. That way it's going to help you uh, be a better engineer and learn from the pros. And uh, when you get your mix back from him, I'm telling you, you're really going to be happy with it because you followed all these steps, creating a good balance, also um, creating to where there's no masking in anymore. And you gave all the instruments space. See, this is going to help your, this is going to help your mastering engineer out tons, man. Because he's going to have to do very little EQ. What EQ he does on the mix, it's just going to make it shine and shimmer. And so, uh, but uh, having a relationship with your mastering engineer is a good thing. And look, man, here's the thing. It's not a whole bunch of money to get your songs mastered, you know, uh, especially if you're just doing like one single. If you're doing a single and that's all you want to get you know, mastered, that's just the cool thing to do these days just simply because... Um, that's what people are buying. They don't buy albums anymore. They don't buy CDs anymore. They, they listen. They like one song, and that's the song they buy and put on their iTunes. One song. So um, I've gotten to where that's just the way I do. I, I mix out one song, and I'll send it to a mastering engineer and let him take care of it. A few hundred bucks or whatever. It's a done deal, and you know it's going to just sound really, really good. So don't bypass the mastering engineer, even though you can, and I have before, I am guilty of it. Don't pound past him, man. You're really going to be happy with what he um, sends you back. 
especially if you send it to a facility to where there's a real guy actually putting it through. Uh, and then also ask him for his references. So, I mean, he might be, uh, you don't want to, what I'm saying is you don't want to send it to some guy in his bedroom that um, is, is adding plugins to the mix to make it sound, you know, radio airplay. You want to send it to somebody that's a real person that has a mastering facility that he's mastered songs for big time artists, you know, Eric Clapton, Billy Idol, um, you know, Led Zeppelin, whoever, you know, all these big groups, those are the mastering engineers you want to send your stuff to because your results are going to be right on target, man. I hope this helped you out tonight, man. Uh, it really is a good thing to, uh, Mixing is so much fun. It's an art that you never stop learning and you continue to get better and better and better as you go. Uh, and as you learn different stages of the mixing process, don't get discouraged with it. Like I say, uh, it's very important to have a reference on one track to where you're bouncing back and forth throughout uh, your mixing session just to see, uh, to keep it in the ballpark that where you're not doing anything too crazy with your mix. Because sometimes... If you don't have a strategy how you go about mixing, uh, you really, it's kind of like throwing at a dartboard with no target in the dark, you know. Uh, if you're in the dark and you're just going to be throwing all over the place and just guessing as to where your dart landed. So having a target to shoot for, which is your reference, uh, gives you a better focal point, a better idea as to creating your mix as close as you can to it, even though it's going to sound different. That's okay. We want that. But at least we're, we're in the same ballpark, right? Thank you guys for joining in tonight, man. Some great information I shared with you. I hope you were able to take some of it in. And uh, I hope you're able to use some of that. My phone's blown up. <laughs> but uh, we're going to be talking about some other things on another video. We're going to actually be talking about how to thicken up tracks and doubling tracks. I just touch the surface on that tonight you guys because i kind of wanted to not blow through everything or my 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 the way i mix or anything but i, I wanted to um just kind of give you an idea of how i mix and how i i get things going fast and then I, i'll break away every 15 minutes just you guys please do this so you don't um hurt your ears but every 15 minutes or so just, you know, walk away from the mix, go take a break, leave, come back at it, you know, uh, later on. And uh, it's going to give you a new perspective of where you're at, because a lot of times if you get caught up in the mix too long, things can be deceiving and you can start pushing up levels to where you don't want them there anymore. And it can be not so good for you, man. So I hope this helped you out tonight, man. Uh, as always at Audio Master. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, subscribe to the channel right down there. Go ahead and hit it, man, and slam that bell. And uh, type down there as to why you like a Sure microphone. That'll get you in the contest for a Sure SM7B microphone giveaway. You don't want to miss out on that, man, so it's easy. Slam that bell, man, and uh, hit that subscribe. Remember, excuse me, to like and share. That's going to help... Uh, other people that enjoy uh, anything to do with audio and recording. It's going to help this video get an algorithm to where they can see it too, man. And what we want to do is continue to share our knowledge with others so they can get better at recording. And ultimately, don't we all want to get better at mixing and mastering and recording since that's what we love to do. Thank you guys for joining in tonight. Thank you, man. And you know what else? You don't want to miss out on an Audio Master t-shirt. If you like recording and audio, how can you not want a beautiful Audio Master? And you're going to like them, man. They're, they, uh, they're going to be really, really cool, and everybody's going to want one. And when I get them in, in a week or so, I'm going to do a video and show you guys how bad to the bone they look, and everybody's going to want one, man. So you want to get in the giveaways on them, too. I've got 10 that I'm giving away to... Um, to people that are uh, my regulars on here always write in they always write in and say good comments and have good things to say those people dude are going to get free shirts man they're not cheap and um 
and be giving those away. And then the other ones I'm going to be doing drawings on. So you can get in and on drawing by subscribing to the channel and be a part of this ride, man. Be a part of the journey as we cruise along through this uh, adventurous life of audio recording, mixing, and mastering. And how wonderful it is with all the tools that we have to work with these days. Such a beautiful thing. Uh, especially for you guys that are single, that with no other responsibilities, I know that you can spend tons and tons and tons of hours in the recording studio playing your instrument, tracking, mixing. It's all such a blast, and it's a, been a lifetime love for me. I want to say about 30 years now, man, and you know what? Uh, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to continue to learn continue to share great information with you guys that are just starting out. And so also type down there as to maybe something that you'd like me to talk about, man, because um, I'd love to share that information with you so that you don't make the same mistakes I made on a lot of my mixes and just took me a long time to figure things out. So I hope this helps you out tonight, man. I hope uh, you start using some of these tricks and techniques in your repertoire. Use them every day. You're going to get better and better and better at it. The more you use these techniques, the more you use your tools. And also, I did want to mention this on this video, so I don't forget, when you're putting those compressors in line on uh, your bus tracks or on your track, just use your ears, man. Use your ears. Don't go by so much with ratios and all that other stuff. They are important. Trust me, they are important. A three to one or or whatever ratio on vocals or however you want to hit it or whatever you want to do. All that stuff's important. You can learn about compressors. There's other videos on how to learn about compressors, but even more so than learning all the techniques and what the go-to is, is use your ears. If it sounds good, then you're in the ballpark. Remember that. That's key. Does it sound good? If it sounds good, then it's good. And you'll be happy with that decision that you made. Thank you guys for joining in tonight. As always, we appreciate you here at Audio Master, our Trib Studios. Hit that subscribe bell, and we will see you again.